Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to High Point Market. Welcome to Universal Furniture. Uh, my name is Neil McKenzie, Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Universal. And if it's your first time here, welcome. Uh, the showroom is massive. There's tons to see and a lot of fun <laughs> stuff happening this week. You are in the Learning Center. Uh, we have 15 events uh, over the course of the next five days here. Um, if you didn't register for any of them, you can still do so. Uh, if you can't attend one, it's okay because we do record them all. So you'll get a video uh, of anything you've missed and you can kind of watch that um, as you see fit. But there's some great, great speaking sessions this week on a number of different topics. So definitely you, uh, encourage you to check that out. Uh, from a showroom standpoint, we certainly uh, would welcome um, you guys to stay and tour and shop. Um, if you wanna just check in at the front desk after this, feel free to do so. Um, there's also uh, scanners that we have. Everything in the showroom is tagged. So if you are interested in things, which we hope you are, uh, you can scan away. And when you check out, just hand that scanner back to the front desk and you're gonna get an email. If everything you scanned makes it so much easier uh, just to kind of remember all the highlights. Um, from a collection standpoint, we have a new introduction with Coastal Living on three called Weekender, which I encourage you to check that out. And then downstairs, we have the Designer's Lounge, which has a lot of fun things, activations happening throughout the week. Uh, there's a champagne uh, mixologist session happening on Saturday and Sunday. There's some fun swag bags with our friends from Room Magazine. So all sorts of goodies and uh, definitely encourage you to uh, come back, come often and have a good time. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Courtney is from Home uh, Decor Now. Home News Decor Now? Decor News Now, Decor yeah. News Now. Thank yep. you. Thank you. We're under the Home News Now banner. Thank you. Yep. Yes. It's been a long week already. I so. know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll let Courtney kind of introduce the panel. And thank you all for making some time this afternoon to join us. And we appreciate it. Thanks, Neil. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Universal. Uh, like you said, I'm Courtney Porter. I'm the editor-in-chief of Decor News Now. Um, I want to give this panel an alternate title just to be cutesier and call it <laughs> City Mouse, Country Mouse Design. <laughs> um, just shout out. Where are you all from, City? Where are you from? Chicago. Raleigh. All over the place. Cool. Um, and have you all had a chance to tour Universal yet? Yes. No. Okay. Well, if you haven't, right when we're done here, I suggest going up to the top floor and taking a cruise through the Coastal Living Collection. Because uh, something that really struck me when I toured it yesterday was that it's kind of outgrown its name. Uh, even though the Coastal stuff is still in there, of course. It's a little deeper than that now, and you can really put that stuff on the coast. You can put that uh, in the Midwest. You can put it anywhere. Um, so the first question I'm going to pose to our panel, um, and I will introduce all of them, is before we get into the verses, city versus country, um, what unites us? What's universal? What is uh, something stylistically a request you get from clients, no matter where they're from? What's the through line? Um, so... Without further ado, I'll introduce the panel and let each of them answer that question. Uh, so we have Robert Ventolo. Robert, you're uh, based in New York, but you have clients all over the place. And what what's uniting your clients all over the place? Yeah, I, I find that like practicality is very important. And I also like to have things that have a long lifestyle um, because I find if you don't like pick the select the fabrics and the materials correctly um, over time they wear and then you could go back even two or three years later and if it's not really the right thing and it's not going to really look too good after that so uh, that's it. Christian Daw based in DC um, but also all over the place yeah. I said to him right before the panel I thought you were from Jersey because um, <laughs> all your clients are in Jersey right now we, def we definitely have quite a few, um, but yeah, I do work all over. We're in 12 states actively, 16 over the past year. Um, so lots of, lots of travel. I book a lot of miles and I don't love that part of my job. That's my absolute least favorite <laughs> part of my job. Um, it lost its appeal probably like two years ago. Um, but so yeah, I work all over. I think kind of like what Robert said, I agree that there's a through line of practical fabrics and um, things of that nature. Most people at this point, no matter how sophisticated their tastes are, still don't want a fabric to wear and pill and um, 
not work for a dog or a child after six months or whatever. So, but I think for me, stylistically, what's a through line is my clientele, no matter how modern, which I'm not necessarily a modern designer in the slightest, although this year we've had a couple clients who that's really fits their aesthetic. Um, but my clientele, no matter how modern they are, there's very much a traditional backdrop. So it's, um, we do very little exposed drywall in any of the projects we do. It's almost probably 80 to 90% millwork and then wallpaper to fill in the rest. So even ceilings, we just very rarely have any, especially in primary spaces. But I think that no matter how modern the furnishings is, there's a, a relatively traditional backdrop. Great. And Marta Mitchell, you're from here. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm the country mouse of this group, obviously <laughs> listening to these guys. Um, I think what all of our clients have in common is personality. So we really focus on designing for the client. And yes, performance is a big deal. I see the trend you're talking about, Christian. But I think everybody wants to have a home that feels like they design themselves, but it's really good. So, um, so that's what we try to do. Listen as much as we can and, and design for what they need. Okay, now the fun part. What is the biggest drastic difference? Between clients. Mm -hmm. Near and far. And I, I think get, to give that some context, uh, let us know where your clients are, your local clients, and who's the furthest client away and everything in between. Um, well, I'll, I'll go on this one. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I think the, the biggest difference is going to be understanding of investment. So there are some people who are like, well, I've been to home goods. I know what things cost. I'm like, no, no, man, I'm not. <laughs> um, but I, I, through education, most people are receptive to it and they end up getting a very beautiful space in the end. Um, but we, we are actively trying to, to build like a very local clientele, primarily due to the whole travel um, preference on my part or non-travel preference. So we kind of take jobs we might not otherwise in our local vicinity just to get our name out there. Um, but we've done like consulting work in the Bahamas, in Indonesia, but most everything else has just been US. We have one project in Maine that's kind of far away. We've done LA, um, but Maine feels a lot farther because it's a lot more remote. Than <laughs> How do you bridge that gap? Um, for the clients that don't necessarily understand, how do you educate them? Um, I'm, I have almost like a deadpan um, talking style with clients. There, there is zero judgment, um, and I, I make that very clear. I'm like, you can tell me your budget's a dollar. You can tell me your budget's unlimited, and that's great. You're, I, I will still do the best I can for you. Um, oftentimes, to the dismay of my team, they don't like when I agree to certain <laughs> budgets, but. We will work within it. And as long as you know that this is what your budget will allow, and I will tell you very clearly what that will afford you, and you can choose, do you want it to, to look pretty and not last, look pretty and last, or just last? Because they're different um, combinations of all of those. And if you want that, I, I don't have such a... Um, distinguished personal style that, that I will force upon others to to make any sort of demands. I just, I'm just very clear. And I've been personally at all ends of those, of the spectrum to, to where I had one budget at one time and everywhere in between to the opposite of the spectrum. So, um, I can empathize with them and be just very clear and just literally tell them this is what you get. And they seem this. receptive to that. Yeah. I, I think, cause I say it with, with love and zero judgment sure. that allows for that to be received better. And I'm very, you can bring things into more personal terms. Everyone's familiar. We, do, we don't do really any retail, but everyone's familiar with what Pottery Barn is. So you can use that as a benchmark depending on where your products fall into to that. There, Everyone knows Ikea, everyone knows Pottery Barn, everyone knows Restoration Hardware, and then everyone knows the expensive designer stuff. So, <laughs> Sure. Uh, Robert or Marta, do you find that you, have, you run into similar issues and what's your communication style like? Um, absolutely. We, we run into those issues. We prefer not to get any clients with a $1 budget <laughs> whenever possible. 
but we do, and we really try to be upfront and make sure that we understand what their expectations are, not just for budget, but for timeline and, and, and style and design. And we are completely transparent and we're really upfront and try to make it really clear that if you do want something from Pottery Barn, absolutely, we'll help you select. We'll give you the links, but we don't want to sell this to you. And, uh, and they seem okay with that. Okay. Actually, I like to sort of mix it up myself. Um, I find it like, a, like even when I have a really high budget, I try to get like the least amount of, you know, expense as possible. And then some, and I put, I like to put the money into like the art because I feel like that's a really good investment for my clients. Um, and, and that sort of, sometimes that changes also like when the clients, sometimes they have art and it could be like Hudson River School. So then you have to work around that or it could be completely, you know, modern. Um, and which is nice. And I like the diversity of that. Do you find with art buying for your clients, do you find that the taste and budget for art changes based on geography? Um, to a degree, yeah. Um, I'd say like in New York, uh, it might be a little bit more serious than say a, a project in Florida. We do a lot of work out in the Hamptons. And so it's a, a lot of times just even for um, security reasons, you wouldn't want a really huge expensive place in some of the more remote areas. Sure, because you're never there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the, fir the first uh, place that I ever did was in Dubai. It was a client I first did their place in the city, and then they asked me to help them out with their apartment there. And um, they're very sophisticated as far as you know design, um, and they came with a lot of um, antiques from their family, which were French, very formal. And um, the first apartment that I did for them was down in the Richard Meyer building, which is completely glass. Wow. and there's not one molding or anything in the whole thing so we sort of mix some of those antiques with with new pieces and it, i think it turned out really well very, very cool. happy so uh stylistically what do you find are the biggest differences between uh geographically mm -hmm. big cities and small towns yes it varies so it i don't know that geographically it makes a huge difference it's all about the client we had kind of a fun project a few years ago in new york city on park avenue and it was uh, two corporate apartments. And uh, the corporation was an outdoor corporation, but they had headquarters in North Carolina. So they wanted the two apartments to be completely different. One uh, was super New York and very cosmopolitan and, and, and stylish in that direction. And the other one, they wanted to feel like the mountains of North Carolina so that they feel like they could be home when they were on business in New York. So from the style perspective, it's all about the culture and it's all about the culture of the client itself more so than, than where it is. Are most of the homes you're designing uh, that are near and far, are these for repeat clients with multiple homes or are you doing long distance design for new clients or both? For us, both. So a lot of our remote clients are our clients here first, and then we do second homes. Um, same thing for us. Most of our clients are new overall, but um, we have done quite a few of repeats, and it's mostly in the second home. We had one who moved multiple times over the course of two years, and we did each house almost to completion until their final one. Nice. <laughs> <And> their final. <laughs> uh, most of my jobs are repeat uh, from, well, I'll do one project, and then it'll bring me on to, to do another home. But I find like some areas, like for example, Florida has a very like distinctive look. Um, it's very sort of like hotel, modern. And so I'm doing a project there now, which I'm trying to completely mix it up with, you know, antiques and Italian pieces. Because um, I think it just sort of gets so ordinary. And I don't think you really need a designer if you really want that sort of aesthetic. I can't wait to see photos of that one. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, she started, started, she really wanted something that was Venetian. So we were just looking at like painted ceilings and now we sort of turned it down, toned it down to more of a, um, a more of a Milan sort of feeling. So, uh, so it's, um, we're just starting actually next week to tear up all the floors that we're all doing all like a, um, limestone and taking up like the old like terracotta tile that was there before so it should be interesting 
Cool. Yeah. When you are acquiring a new client that doesn't live where you are, where are they finding you? How are they finding you? Uh, for me, this client actually saw a place that I did in New York, and um, and I've actually I've done two two apartments for them um, already as well. So um, and it was actually in one of the apartment hotels in the city. So I, that's how I got that project. What about for both of you? For us, most of our work is referrals. Okay. Um, however, having the website as uh, validation is really nice because clients are giving referrals to friends and, and, and then they just go back to our website just to see, oh yeah, these people are for real. For me, it's the, the new, the newer wave of that I'm on social media and that's where a lot of people connect. Um, we actually don't even have an active website at the moment. Our website is down, um, and it's never been fully like a robust site as it is. Hopefully we'll have it up, um, properly and hopefully weeks and not months. Um, but yeah, we, we have a few referrals. We had one project come from a show house we did. Um, but otherwise it's social media or, um, a, a couple of friends of friends. Was and then the show house you did local or was that a distance design? That was local, but I mean, it was local to where I live, but it was during, it was happening during the pandemic. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. And I relocated during that time to another another property and so i actually made it a distance project <laughs> so that speaks to something I, I wanted to get to uh which is what what in what way does technology factor into this when you're designing for someone who lives far away um what sort of tools are you presenting to them to communicate uh how are you sending samples Do they want to touch stuff they want to sit on stuff how does that work uh, we usually like have like a zoom meeting at least once a week um, and then they usually come into the city um, to, f I like everybody to sit in all the furniture. Mm. Um, and especially when we're making it custom, we, we first make it a Muslim. And then, so then we could sort of at that point refine it. Um, and I think the technology really helps a lot to be able to, uh, you know, communicate, you know, meetings. And even if it's not just once a week, if it's multiple days a week you know it's the client will the contractor will show you an issue that they want you to, to detail right. and uh, yeah so it's it's really good help what about for either of you for us we use technology for everything I mean we're really investing and working hard to continue to learn we model almost every project that we work on so we build it in 3d uh, we're doing VR now, so we can communicate with a link. You know, we can just send a link to the clients and this is it. Walk through it and, and see it. But Zoom is great and we try to do as many site visits as possible. We try to go to the sites and visit and interview contractors and, and all of that. Next time we're in New York, I'm going to skip all of that and I'm going to call Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the best contractor? <laughs> what does that look like in your contract? Uh, how do you break out? How many site visits you're going to do? How do you communicate that ahead of time? We just spell it out ahead of time. So it depends. It all depends on the project. If it's new construction, yeah, you know, it's like phase one, phase two, phase three. If it's a renovation project, it's totally different. If it's um, uh, you know just uh, FF and E, it's it's a whole different ball game. So we try. We actually, we might be the only people that I know of who we don't actually have a contract. Uh, I always have this joke that uh, we're in a meeting, we work in teams of two on our team. And I always say, well, if you decide that you don't really like this color blouse, we're done. We're done. Yeah. Okay. No, no need to, uh, to stay long term. Huh. The, 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 the chemistry needs to work. You know, the relationship is more important than a contract, okay. I think. Uh, something Robert and I were talking about was sustainability. And sometimes when you're designing at a distance, um, you're really adding to your carbon footprint. So I'm curious to know how you guys offset that or if that's something you care about at all. We definitely care about, but in terms of actively offsetting it, no. I do try to um, dissuade people from making selections that are fast furniture um, kind of level. Um, I'm all for, I would, I, to a lot of, a lot of my clients surprise, I'm very open and to go through their inventory of items and see what can be modified, upcycled, 
restored. Um, a lot of people are like, well, I've, I've had these these chairs since like my grandparents gave them to me, but there's yeah. zero like desire to have in my house. I'm like, well, it's actually kind of nice. We can, we can work with it. Um, so I'm definitely open to that. And then in terms of, um, I, I try to think outside of the box and that kind of stuff all the time. We're doing a project in Nashville right now. And it's a, um, a big, like 150 acre project. They're going to have horses and there are a couple older barns that were torn down. They saved all of the barn wood. And now that's going to be the entire cladding in the, the, um, the husband's gym because okay. he really wants it rustic. And the rest of the house is the opposite of that. Oh. So we're cladding an entire 1500 square feet in authentic from the property. From there, that's wow. cool. Yeah, no ways. I saw nods. I, I try to find like fabrics that are sustainable um, and they're really good looking now and they're very soft. Um, also, like I try to find uh, vendors that are local and, you know, or like family businesses that have been generations. And I also like to use as much as possible that the client brings and, you know, re, re, reupholster it, refinish it. But I find that, you know, things that they've seen for a long time or they've been in their family is important to them. And I think it also sort of makes it more of them than it is of, say, a designer that just comes in and says, well, we're going to change everything uh -huh. and it's going to look like this. And you have like a very specific look. Um, and I think I think it's much better for everybody to have a little bit more interest. Yeah. Marta? Yeah, same. I mean, it's really important. Yes figuring out what's the best way to do it, right? We, uh, one of our designers now is working on a project in Costa Rica, and that's really been fun from the sustainability perspective is because there's so much there that can be reused. They have handmade tiles. And uh, so, so that's really been fun. So again, doing it in different parts of sure. the country or the world is trying to figure out the best way to do it from what's available in that location. So speaking of what's available in that location, you touched on local artists. Um, how do you find local talent? How do you find a local installer, local wallpaper, et cetera? Call Robert. Call Robert, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I, that is pretty much what you do. You just call yeah. people. Yeah. Um, I'm, I have like, my designers are in a couple Facebook groups. I'm in one myself and I'm like, okay, we're, we're doing something and Oklahoma. I've never worked there before. Let's figure it out. And we have to have all of that done. We, we try to have all of those things prepped from the first time we sign the letter of agreement. So we can hopefully by the time we do our like, like kickoff meeting, have at least some understanding of um, who the players are. And then we always work in tandem with architects and contractors. Mm -hmm. Now, even though we do, we have two architects on staff, we're not, um, we don't stamp our own drugs. There's always those those local. Trainers. We have a little union on Facebook. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> so social media really factors into your business in a number yeah, of ways. It, that really helps. And also, I find I, I also ask a lot of the vendors, especially the ones that have been in business for a long time, because they have a lot of clients that are all over the place. And I have this one woman that she works actually at Kravit. She's like my fairy godmother. She'll, she'll say, oh, do you have anybody in Florida? And she's like, yeah, and I even know these guys that can like help you out with overseeing it. And, you know, so I find that that's really a good, good source. Yeah. And then as far as finding um, local artists, local furniture vendors in the location, where, where do you find those? Where's that coming from? A lot of times I just Google you know, and then just see, and then I'll just go out and meet with them. And uh, I find that that really works as well. How much does travel balloon your budget, by the way? You sound like you make a lot of the site visits. Uh, I, so our contract's kind of unique in that when I started, I made the value proposition to potential clients to saying like, hey, you want to hire me? You found me online. You have no, you had no idea that I'm 2000 miles away here. We're, we're in this together. We're going to split these costs. So in my contract, it all reasonable um, travel related expenses um, are split 40, 60. So I only pay 40%. They pay 60. It's um, an expense for the business. And I then don't feel bad if I'm getting like a really nice dinner or staying at a nicer <laughs> hotel or things like that. Um, so to me, it is split, but we don't like we, I, I travel to one, I try to limit it to one client a week. So one airplane ride somewhere for a week. Some projects are, I can be in and out in a day. Others I can 
it, I have to do an overnight. I just came from Indiana. And even though I just had, uh, it was like a two hour meeting, I still had to stay overnight and fly here at 6 a.m. But um, I, so I try to limit that, but it is a, it is a big line item, mm -hmm. but the client pays for most of it. And every time I go, I also have an eight hour per diem minimum. So even if it's a two hour meeting, it's still billed as eight hours Got it. plus travel time. Okay. Marta, how does, how does yours work without a contract? We, um, we bill, you know, expenses at cost. Okay. A hundred percent. And, uh, but travel time, because we have a design time element, travel time is half of our design fee. So we still bill for That's travel for time, too. but it's half, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I don't charge for travel time. Like, you know, I, even when I go like locally, I just feel like it's a little too much. I don't know. Um, and then also too, when I stay, I usually pay for all like my expenses. Cause I feel like if I was in New York, you know, I'd still have to be paying these expenses. Fair. So um, that's sort of work. But I, I, most of the time, I don't really work with a contract as well. I mean, most of the time, they're, they're clients that I've worked with before, so they know how I work. Um, lately, with some of the new ones, I've been sending contracts out, um, but it's just something new. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious about the crowd here. How many designers do we have in the audience? Good handful. And that then, whole back there. Yeah, all, they're all there. They're all mine. They're all, <laughs> they all work for Marta. Um, and uh, do all of you do long distance design? Show of hands. Uh, and then show of hands if you haven't, but you'd like to. <coughs> okay, no, all right. We have a pretty experienced crowd here. So um, I guess the question was going to be, uh, this is why I asked you guys, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out on their first long distance design project? But um, are we still curious about that answer or are you guys? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear. <laughs> I would. I, I think my first project in uh, Florida was like really interesting because you have to sort of know like the humidity issue that's so different from New York because <laughs> yeah. we were gonna have the woman like keep her clothes. We were renovating an apartment and we were gonna have her keep her clothes in the closets. And then somebody was telling me, no, you can't because you know. The, the, you know, when the AC might be not on and, you know, in parts and the furniture, the clothes are going to be destroyed. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I, it's a good to know. <laughs> and then later on too, I was um, storing furniture for someone and they said also you had to make sure that it was in temperature control because of the humidity could cause mold. So I think it, those are the things that to really you know, like sort of investigate. Sure. What about other of you? For me, the best thing that we've ever done um, and continue to do is get to know the maintenance crew and any doorman or any gates people, uh, electricians, whoever, subcontractors it is, make sure they like it. Hmm. So we come in, if we're out of town, it'll come for an install. We bring croissants and we bring coffee and we spend extra time chit-chatting. They show pictures of the children. And we create this relationship and there's nothing they want to do for you if they like you. If you come in just stomping your feet and, you know, full ego, bigger than anything, they will avoid you at any cost. So, and, and I promise you, you will need those people. So make sure they like you. That's true. Um, I agree with a lot of what Marty just said. We will like do like pizza for crews and things like that. Um, not so much croissant, so that's a lot cuter. Um, <laughs> but um, really, I mine's like a very practical suggestion. Um, the things that you do not have a hundred percent in your wheelhouse, try to push off onto the contractor, onto the local the local help there. Um, we have a project we've been working on for a long time in Indiana. It's right about to be um to be installed like between over the next few weeks and um with that one we were having a hard time with finding good drapery people and we've been able to and reupholstery people and lo local talent in in this area and we've been able to successfully push all of that onto the contractor um and wow. he's borne the the brunt of some mishaps but it was there they're open to it. They help. They're navigating that they're open to it. We're, we're team members with them, but it's really been um, a lifesaver to us to not have to handle that remotely however many miles away. Yeah. Um, 
So it's been great if you can do that. So Robert kind of answered my next question already, um, which is, can you share an anecdote of a horror story that pertains to long distance design? Hmm. I didn't think about that. Oh, you have none. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Think of one. Real pros here. <laughs> We've had some really where we're dealing right now where I'm glad we have a contract in place because it's very our I'm I used to be a lawyer and so I wrote our contract. Um it's entitled letter of agreement and there's a lot of like colloquial terms and it's written casually and not not it's just not an aggressive contract, um, four pages, um, all in. And I'm so glad I have it because I very outline, very much outline the specific differences between contracting, ma contractor management, project management, and what we do, which is purely like, um, insisting on the confirmation to our plans as presented. And so I like break that out in a very clear fashion and it is helping us because the contractor that the client went with it's probably going to end in litigation between the two of them. Right. Um, and that client is frustrated that he can't pin as much stuff on me at the moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> otherwise, the project is great and wonderful, but I'm very grateful that um, I have that that contract language. And a lot of that was because it's also a long distance project. Mm -hmm. Marta? Um, I don't know that I have a horror story on a project specifically, but um, you know, lessons learned for us is that we had several projects in, in Colorado and the Denver area. So we thought we would open an office in Denver. Sounded like a great idea. We had a designer there, we had clients, we had resources working with contractors. What we didn't plan is the logistics of being in North Carolina, purchasing merchandise here, shipping over there, arriving at a warehouse damaged, having to ship back. It was a total nightmare, especially with lighting. There were a couple of projects that was really heavy in all new lighting fixtures that arrive at the warehouse, sits there until the project's ready, and then you open the box, even though they inspect it ahead of time, and glass is broken or, or the whatever, something doesn't work. And that was a nightmare. Again, everything worked out fine. It cost us a lot of money because we had to do all this backwards and forwards. And we're not doing that anymore. We're no longer in Colorado as an office location. Got it. And then um, on the other end of the spectrum, what is a project you're really proud of that made you say, I can't wait to do this again? I find like the projects where the clients are so happy. Mm -hmm. And every time they see, oh, we love our house, I find that those are the most successful. Uh, because I think in the end, as far as being an interior designer, the ultimate goal is to make the client happy. And I think when, when I feel like when they, when, I, when they say all these things, then I really, that makes it the best. I mean, it doesn't matter what the style is or what the, mm -hmm. what the budget is. It's just that, well, you did a great job and you know, that's it. I think that's- What do you attribute that to? Um, I think being very sensitive and trying to figure out what they exactly want. Initially, sometimes I ask them to like, you know, go through magazines and pull pictures um, to sort of give me some idea. Um, and I find that that's the most important thing to, to sort of get exactly what they, what they want and what they need and try to also sometimes I, I work for families and like there's multiple need for a home because their second home and their grandchildren will be staying with them. So you have to sort of figure out the whole, you know, dynamics of everyone. So I think that's, that's the most important. Good listening. Yeah. Christian. For me, roughly, roughly the same. It's um, when clients are just very happy and become friends um, and throughout mm -hmm. the process, my, not my very first client, but my second client ever, which I'm a relatively baby designer. I've been doing this since like 2017. Um, but she, we are now installing, like just, we've done so, we, she started hiring me for back when I was still employed in the legal profession. <laughs> um, she hired me for like a couple hours a week to help her pick finishes on the first part of their project. It turned into doing her whole first house just from like an architectural standpoint. Then we did a pool house, then we did their beach house, then we did the rest of their main house. And now we're um, in two weeks, we're installing 
all the furnishings for their full main house, which is something she's wanted to do from the beginning, but it's had to do it in stages. So the fact that she's come back, she's lent us properties to to like enjoy with family. We like go out for cook cookouts. She's watched my daughter. Um, <laughs> like we go and swim in their pool. It's it's been really nice. So, Martin. I think building on the same thing, I think the project that I'm the most proud of was probably one of us, my smallest projects from years and years ago. And uh, even though now we could show, wow, this is, wow, it's amazing, we love it. I'm not as proud of these great, huge projects now as I was of that small one, where it was an older couple moving into our area and he came relocated to a corporation here somewhere. And I met them when they first bought the house. It was empty. It was a great house. It had nice bones and all that. And uh, then they opened their computer and showed me pictures of what they had in their previous house, that they're moving here. And that's the style and everything, just what they want. And I'm really open-minded, but oh my gosh, that was just plain ugly. <laughs> and uh, how do you say that to somebody? You don't, right? Say, well, you know what, I, I'm sure we can do something, you know, like we'll put a plan together and uh, we'll use your stuff and uh, let us work on it for a little bit. And we got pictures and dimensions of all the stuff. And after it was all done, we had to push them a little bit outside of their comfort zone for some things. But when it was done, coming into their house again, and they were so happy and they felt it looked, they had an armored medieval thing. Uh, and swords and all kinds of things. But somehow we made it work and it turned out great. I was really proud of the project when it was done, not just because of how they looked, but how much they loved it. Cool. So I want to ask one more question before I open it up for questions from you guys. Um, and this has nothing to do with long distance design, but we're at market. I know market just started, but how are you shopping market? What are you looking forward to? What's lighting you up right now? <laughs> For me, it's really great to see because I'm in New York, and the showrooms are much smaller, so you you could you don't get to see all the merchandise, and then you know you'll see a photo and it looks oh this looks great, but I really like to feel it and touch it. So it's this is like candy for me to go into the showroom and see oh well, that bench is like really great in person, and so I, I find that that's really great for me. Christian. Um, I'm going to try to see a lot of things. I, I look, so last year, um, I go pretty much every market, but like one of them last year, I didn't bring anyone from my team. It was just me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go like do all the things I want to do. I'm going to go search, like, I'm going to find a couple new upholstery vendors. I'm like, these, this is like a hole in our case goods line that I really want to find. And I, I took my notebook and I was like, diligent, studious, copious notes, mm -hmm. like pictures, drawing things, writing down numbers, all the contact information. And I lost the book <laughs> the last day. I don't know where it went. I was so bummed. And normally I take pictures on my phone. I had so few pictures on my phone. Now I'm, I have, I already started a little bit today. I took like, I'm sending things immediately in real time to Slack when internet and cell service will allow to a separate channel that's just for my high point finds. And I'm also then subsequently taking notes on straight out to the iPad with pictures. And I probably won't lose my iPad. I never do. But that notebook, it and that notebook had so many other things in it too. And it's somewhere sitting on like a, the back of a sofa and some. <laughs> oh. But I'll be trying to get a little bit of that this time as well. Well, that's okay. Well, we're lucky, right? We're local. So our whole team comes. We spent the whole week here. We don't tell anybody where's Neil. Um, we bring our clients so they can see and sit and touch. Um, so um, we take full advantage of the market. Okay. Do either of you bring clients? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I have those sent videos like clients to always request something, even though I'm like, this is definitely not going to your house because we've already done your design or your design's gonna happen in the design <laughs> yeah. phase, but I'll just like appease you. Not really, I, I really do take their thoughts into consideration, but they want to be part of the market experience and they ask and we say, I'm sorry, it's a different, it's not open to, yeah. to that yeah. clientele. Then thank you all so much. Thank you Thanks, for being guys. here. Thank you panel. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Look forward to doing this again and go take a tour of Universal if you haven't. Yes.